So I'm Marty from the OpenStack Foundation. I'm joined by PTL's Steve Baker, who's going to review orchestration, codename Heat, and David Lyle, who's going to review Dashboard, codename Horizon. Today our speakers will each have about a half hour to walk through their latest project updates for you, followed by about five minutes of your questions, give or take. Um, and if you have any additional questions, uh, we'll see if we have time at the end as well. A little back there, the channel. So let's get going. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve. And I'm going to uh, hold on one second. I'm going to turn this into presentation mode for you, Steve, and then you can get going. Let's okay. see. If I'm able to do that. Present. There. Okay. So, okay, so, um, so I'm going to do a, a, the project update for uh, the OpenStack orchestration program, uh, which includes the HEAT project. Um, I'm Steve Baker. Uh, I'm the uh, orchestration PTL for the uh, Icehouse cycle. So if we just go to the, uh, the first slide, um, there's a uh, overview of the uh, Havana release um, code activity. Uh, we had 42 blueprints implemented, um, almost 300 bugs fixed, um, over 800 code commits from 64 people, and almost 4,000 code reviews. Um, so this is this gives a pretty good indication of um, how active this um, this project has has been in the Havana cycle, even though it's um, quite a young project. Now, if you just go to the next slide, there's a uh, there's a, a, a vendor breakdown of contributions. Uh, from the Grizzly cycle. Now, as you can see, it's, it's pretty obvious here that uh, Heat was started out as a project um, sponsored by Red Hat. Um, um, the intention was always that that it wouldn't be this way forever. Uh, so, if we go to the to the next slide, uh, we have the same chart. Um, this is sourced from Stack Stackalytics, by the way. Uh, so this is the Havana chart, and as we can see, uh, the contributions from Red Hat has has gone down to 61%. Um, we've got some major contributions from the likes of IBM, Rackspace, and HP, and also quite a long tail of uh, of contributions from from many other companies. And while the uh, contribution from Red Hat, uh, in relative terms, has gone down significantly, uh, in absolute terms, has actually gone up. Uh, so so this is an indication that uh, the project is growing, and it also has quite a large diversity of uh, contributors from from a number of vendors. Uh, so I think this indicates the the project is, from an open source culture point of view, is is in a really healthy uh, position. Um, so now I'm going to move on to uh, cover some of the features that uh, were in the uh, Havana release. Uh, first up, we've got uh, concurrent resource operations. Uh, previously, when you launched a stack, uh, each uh, resource was created serially, um, and that was even when there was uh, no dependency uh, between uh, any given resource. Um, so, for for some stacks, uh, this was a it would, it would take a long time to launch a stack. Um, but now, um, whenever there's no uh, no direct dependency between any given resource, uh, the resources are, are created in parallel. Uh, this this can have a, a huge performance improvement for uh, for some stacks. Um, next, we've got uh, the provider and environment abstractions. So this gives you a way of uh, changing the way uh, a stack behaves uh, without actually modifying the template. Uh, instead, you you provide a, a separate environment which specifies uh, different behaviors for uh, for a given resource type. Um, and it, it can, this environment can be specified at the cloud operator level or at the individual user level. So a cloud operator might want to uh, provide some different resource types that provide slightly different behaviors from the standard resource types, um, or they might want to uh, override the behavior, the default behavior of a, of a core resource type to um, to integrate some particular um, behavior of their of their cloud, and similarly, when uh, when any user launches a stack, they can also provide an optional environment, which uh, which can give those those same overrides to uh, two different resource types. Now, when you when you uh, 
override a, a resource type or create a new resource type, you're actually authoring it as, as a stack template itself. Uh, so, you, so uh, for example, you could you could override the compute resource type um, as a stack, uh, give the resource type some different defaults, um, add some behaviors. Uh, so it's, it's quite a powerful abstraction, um, but only only for solving certain problems. Um, next, we have um, full solometer integration for uh, metrics monitoring and alarms. So previously, our metrics and alarms um, were implemented as, a, as a, a, a lightweight compatibility layer for the CloudWatch API. Um, that still exists, uh, but now we have a, a full integration with, with a solometer. So um, any, um, any stacks which, which need to uh, trigger actions on, uh, on alarms, such as auto-scaling, uh, can now be driven from uh, metrics that solometer collects. Um, it's possible to push custom metrics uh, from instances to Solometer, um, and it's possible to uh, configure a heat stack to uh, perform actions based on Solometer alarms. Um, we have some new uh, actions, uh, stack suspend and resume. So now an entire stack can be suspended, and uh, for the resources which uh, support, um, support it, uh, whenever a stack is suspended, those resources will go into a suspended state, whatever, mean, whatever that means for that particular resource type. So for example, a Nova server um, will go into a suspended state. And when the uh, stack is resumed, then uh, the server will be resumed as well. Finally, we have um, a standalone mode. Um, it's actually possible to uh, deploy heat uh, outside of a cloud, um, but uh, still be able to launch stacks on, um, on any single arbitrary cloud. Uh, this has a couple of uh, obvious use cases. One is just for development for, uh, for heat developers. Um, you don't have to have a, your own full cloud uh, locally just to uh, develop heat. Um, but, but another, another um, obvious case is if you want to have uh, your own um, local heat deployment, um, which deploys to an open stack that uh, doesn't have its doesn't doesn't have heat support yet, or or just any external open stack, um, you can do that with standalone mode. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we've got um, the usual collection of new resources in each new release. Um, we've got a cinder volume attachment. Um, there's some new resources for Neutron, including load balancing, uh, firewall, and VPN as a service. Uh, there's a new native um, Nova server resource, uh, which is great because now it's possible to uh, write templates without having to uh, specify AWS EC2 instance uh, resources whenever you want to Nova compute. Um, the Nova server resource uh, also exposes uh, Anything in the uh, any any uh, API option that the Nova create uh, API call supports, um, so there's there's a full transparency of, of all Nova features. Uh, and finally, we've got a a collection of um, rack based cloud specific resources that have been uh, put in the contrib directory of the uh, heat repository. Um, it's expected over time that uh, these implementations will get smaller and smaller as, uh, as Rackspace converges on a more standard uh, OpenStack architecture. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we've got some preview features that landed in, H in Havana, but will uh, continue to uh, mature throughout the uh, ice house cycle. Uh, first up, we've got initial support for the hot template language. Uh, so this is a, a, a new native uh, template format, um, which um, is related to, but is, is starting to diverge from the um, CloudFormation um, template format that we started off with. Um, it's based on YAML. Um, we have the flexibility to uh, clean things up, uh, make a template format that's uh, more author-friendly, um, and, uh, and, and it lets us add any, any, any new features that we want uh, without being held back by the CloudFormation format. So we never set any expectations that it would be complete in Havana, um, but we've, we've made some progress in Havana, um, and uh, we have a hope that by, uh, by the Icehouse release, um, the hot template format will be ready for authoring production templates. 
but also we have um, initial integration with Keystone Trusts. Now, currently, when uh, currently a, a, a heat stack needs to make uh, API calls uh, which are not uh, triggered by the user um, throughout the life cycle of the stack. Um, and this, you know, obviously, each API call needs a valid token to call it with. Um, so currently, the only way of achieving this is by actually storing the user credentials uh, with the launch stack and using those credentials to create a token whenever we need one. Um, this is not ideal, um, but with uh, Keystone Trusts, um, instead of storing the credentials, we can uh, store a trust ID, and whenever we need a, uh, a token to do an authenticated operation, um, we can turn that trust into a, into a token uh, and use that for the operation. Uh, so this is this is part of a, a, a range of changes we'll be making, um, which require uh, new Keystone features, um, and that that work will continue in the in the Ice House cycle. So I'm going to start talking about uh, some planned features uh, for the Ice House release. Um, some of these have already landed, but but as as with any um, open source development cycle. Um, we will attempt to, to land these features, um, but it, it depends entirely on, on how the development and uh, review cycle goes. So if there's a, a particular feature that's important to you, then we would strongly encourage you to, to get involved in this, in this um, development process. So as usual in every release, we have a collection of new resources. Um, currently what's, what's been in development and landed so far is um, a Trove resource, a database as a service. Um, a Savana resource um, for uh, big data processing, um, and some new Neutron resources such as a network gateway. Um, so next slide. So auto scaling API. Currently, our auto scaling um, implementation uh, just implements the cloud formation auto scaling uh, within Heat itself. Um, what we plan to do is create a, a brand new API which uh, can be used with or without um, the heat stacks. So if, if you're not currently uh, deploying your applications as heat stacks, but you still want to uh, incorporate auto scaling into your into your architecture, uh, then it will be possible to do that. Um, you'll still have to deploy heat, but you, you have no obligation to uh, directly uh, launch heat stacks. Um, now, the auto scaling API will be flexible enough to um, scale more than just uh, single compute resources. Um, you, can, you can scale you know, compute plus associated resources around it, um, and there does need to be some way of representing those resources um, and, and how they relate to each other and how they expose, um, um, how, how they expose their, their parameters to be integrated with your application. So the, so the obvious way to represent that this little collection of resources that gets scaled is with a, uh, a heat template snippet. So when you interact with the auto scaling API, you will be specifying heat templates in, in some way. Um, now once this auto scaling API exists, um, there will be uh, some heat resources uh, created that consume that API, just like any other heat resource that consumes any other API. Um, and from that point, it will be possible to um, to author templates that pretty much make no reference whatsoever to uh, to cloud formation. Um, the auto scaling resources have have been the probably the most uh, important resources that have yet to have a uh, OpenStack native implementation. Uh, so this is quite a large milestone for us to um, to be able to uh, author completely native implementations that include auto scaling. Uh, so going on to the next slide, there's a hot software configuration. Um, this is also quite a large change. Um, this, these blueprints have a, have a number of, of goals. Um, they include um, being able to integrate any configuration management tool that's commonly used to, uh, to configure uh, software on uh, running compute resources. Um, and, and by configuration tool, I mean I mean tools like uh, Puppet and Chef and SaltStack. Um, 
um, to, to add a new configuration tool uh, just requires um, a small uh, hook to be authored, and that hook needs to be um, delivered to a running instance somehow, um, ideally in a, in, a, in a built image, in a, a golden image, rather than deploying it at boot time. But you could deploy it at boot, at boot time as well. Um, other aims of um, hot software configuration is to uh, uh, provide a, a composability mechanism so that these uh, configuration scripts can remain in their own configuration files or be invoked by, via, uh, via URL. Um, so this will, this will quite radically change the way that uh, templates are authored um, and the way that, um, that you write templates which do uh, complex uh, software configuration. So next slide, management API. Um, there will be a new API that uh, is only used by uh, cloud operators. Um, it will give them some operations uh, that uh, an operator would need to, uh, to manage a heat deployment um, so that uh, all running stacks can be uh, queried and viewed and potentially uh, manipulated. Uh, once the API exists, you know, we'll, we'll incrementally add to it over time uh, based on uh, whatever operators need. Uh, so next slide, got the um, heat multi-engine scale out. So our heat API has always uh, scaled out because it's, uh, it's just an API process, it's uh, stateless, so we just use uh, normal load balancing techniques to do that. Um, but we couldn't do that with the, with the heat engine <coughs> because uh, the heat engine does, does maintain some state uh, during long run, running operations such as stack create or stack update or stack delete. Um, so we've, until now we've been limited to uh, having a single uh, heat engine process uh, for a given stack deployment. Um, the current implementation um, requires, uh, sorry, if we could just go back. Yeah, current implementation requires requires a a locking based solution. Um, that may change in the future, but it's it's, it's lock based for now. Um, the default lock is just based on a database table. Um, but there is a, a plug-in system so that uh, an operator could choose to deploy a different distributed lock, such as uh, Zookeeper. Um, but it does allow um, scale out of, of uh, heat engine now. Uh, so next slide. So stack convergence and failed update recovery. Now there are cases where um, the, the real-world resources um, for a stack um, can get out of sync with what uh, Heat believes the state should be. Um, this can happen due to transient failures or uh, due to manual intervention um, of, of resources um, that, uh, that Heat wasn't aware of. Um, and when this happens, it's, it would be nice to be able to um, bring those real-world world resources back into line with, uh, with what he believes it should be. And this is what convergence is all about. So convergence will uh, sort of introspect the real-world resources, uh, compare them to, to what uh, he thinks they should be, and then come up with an action plan to, uh, to run the appropriate uh, API operations to, to bring that state back in line. And in a way related to this is the uh, failed update recovery. Um, currently when you, um, when you do a stack update and that update fails, then the stack is stuck in a, in a failed update state and, and you really have no choice but to uh, create a new stack. Um, but updates could fail for, for many reasons. Um, it could be a template authoring error or it could be uh, a transient cloud error. So um, really you need to be able to run update as many times as, as you want to until you get it into uh, a, a state that you're happy with. Um, so that, that will be possible now. Uh, so next slide, uh, stack abandon and adopt. Um, these are two related features that also um, have uses by themselves. So stack abandon, um, it, it 
it's a light stack delete, but it does not delete the underlying uh, real-world cloud resources. It, it leaves them in a created state. Um, so one, one use case where you would want to use it abandoned by itself is, this, is if you wanted to use heat to deploy a resource, to, to deploy a collection of resources, but you don't want to use heat to manage the, the resource lifecycle as a whole. So you could uh, create that stack and then abandon it immediately, and those resources still exist, but on their own. Um, now, when you abandon a, a stack, it also gives you a, a packet of information that uh, describes uh, the resources in that stack. And you can actually use that packet of information uh, to pass it to the adopt uh, call. So adopt will take that packet and it will create a stack, but it won't create any, any resources. It will just attach to the resources that, uh, that are specified in that packet of data. Uh, so as you can see, abandon and, and adopt can be used together. Uh, you could abandon a stack on one heat uh, instance, such as a local standalone, and then adopt it on another uh, heat deployment, such as, um, such as the heat that comes with the cloud um, that uses that, that stack, that, that, that uses those resources. Actually, adopt can also be used by itself. Um, if you manually um, author that packet of information, you could, in some circumstances, uh, adopt um, adopt the resources uh, that, that you specify. So uh, resources that are created manually um, could then be adopted by a heat stack, and from that point on, uh, the heat, um, heat will manage the life cycle of those resources. Uh, so next slide. Uh, it will be able to, um, it will be possible to launch all stacks without needing admin privileges. So uh, currently, uh, some stacks, um, the, the resources for some stacks um, also create uh, users um, to allow um, authenticated API operations to, to occur within the scope of that resource. And to create a user, currently, you need to um, launch the stack with a admin privileges user. And this, this has been a, a, a real problem from us for, for, for a long time now, and, it, and um, we, have a, we have a plan now for, for solving this issue. Um, so it will now be possible to uh, launch any heat stack um, with, with, uh, with a conventional user. And then finally, V2 API. Um, we have a plan to, to have a new V2 API. Um, it gives us, us a chance to clean up a few things, such as having the uh, tenant ID in the in the URL, and um, and for not requiring the um, stack ID and the stack name to be in the path for stack operations. Um, it also gives us a chance to um, to have a better handling of uh, request scoping and, and policy for. Uh, for um, authorizing stack operations. Um, so that's all I have at the moment. Um, I'd be uh, more than happy to um, answer any questions now. Um, I see a question here. The um, question is, we have noticed there is limited support for CentOS in Heat. Is there a plan to add more support in IceHouse? Um, So I guess we need to find out what, what we mean by uh, support for CentOS. Uh, is, that, is that for um, deploying heat on CentOS or for using CentOS as a uh, guest? But to answer your question, um, with, the, with the announcement that um, Red Hat uh, will be um, participating in the CentOS community, um, we, we would expect that uh, support for CentOS will be will be very good um, in the in the near future, both as a guest and for uh, for um, installing um, heat on CentOS via the uh, RDO distribution. But as as long as as long as CentOS has um, has uh, cloud in it, um, it should integrate well with the uh, the new uh, hot software configuration that we're planning for this cycle.
Any additional questions for Steve? Feel free, uh, the uh, line is open if you want to ask, or you can put them in chat. Okay, so just in the last couple of days, there's, um, there's been some interest in uh, using um, Windows as a, as a heat um, guest. Um, there are a couple of projects out there that are, that are pertinent. Um, there's Cloud Base Init, which is a port of Cloud Init uh, that uh, also works on Windows. Um, uh, there's the Murano, Murano project, which, um, which among other things is an application catalog for um, deploying uh, complex Windows applications that uses heat under the hood. Um, so that there is some activity there right now. Um, I expect the way that a hot software configuration would, inter would integrate with Windows is that um, uh, the Windows image would need cloud base in it, um, and it would need some kind of um, hook, a software configuration hook, um, which lets you um, specify configuration operations um, in PowerShell or, or whatever other um, Windows configuration options there are. Um, so I'm not personally working on that, but uh, there, is, there is interest and activity in that area at the moment. Great. And if anyone else has additional questions, you can put them in the chat box, or I think there's meeting Werner sends a, an email afterwards. You can send them back to me as well, and I'll get them back to Steve. Great. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Cool. I'm going thank to you. turn it over. Yes, good job. I'm going to turn it over to David. David, let me get your presentation up. Myself. Okay. So, David, when you're ready. Okay. All set. Well, great. Hello, my name is David Lyle. I'm the Horizon Program PTL, and this is the OpenStack dashboard project update. Slide, please. So, in a recently completed Havana release, we uh, made a lot of progress. We had 41 completed um, blueprints, uh, 400 with a total of 406 commits, and fixed 282 bugs. Um, next slide, please. So, and that comes from a community of 104 contributors, which I'm really proud of. It's up from 58 in Grizzly, so we've got quite a bit of community growth, um, and that's uh, those commits come from 34 uh, different companies, as long as, as well as some unaffiliated contributors. Um, the and there's a lot. It's not just one company dominating uh, the commits any longer. Um, Red Hat, HP, NEC, Mirantis, United Stack, MetaCloud, Tuesday, Nebula is still in there as well. Um, so. Very, very diverse uh, contribution base, which again is, uh, to me, is a good, great indication of the health of the community. Um, again, uh, and also we, you know, 217 reviews, a lot of reviews by a lot of various reviewers, um, and so that certainly is helping our pro project along. Next slide. So, what did we accomplish in Havana? Well, we got our first pass at heat integration as heat uh, came out of incubation and uh, graduated from incubation in the cycle before Havana. Uh, then we added heat integration in Havana, um, and that included stack creation. Uh, you can actually import the stack uh, definition from a URL. Uh, you go ahead and launch that stack and then view the topology as it builds and as, as well as when it's up, and then be able to do uh, do some resource inspection once that stack is is up and created. Um, Solometer also came out of in incubation in the cycle before uh, Havana, so we graduated. So in the Havana cycle, we added <coughs> the preliminary support for Solometer. So the initial support is is just an admin, uh, oops, excuse me, uh, in the admin panel, and it's just doing cross uh, cloud querying for um, certain pieces of utilization. The plan in the future is to get a more full featured uh, integration with Solometer, uh, but this was the first pass at it. We 
we also added uh, Keystone v3 API support. Uh, so this was a, a fairly large effort um, to add domains, groups, and roll uh, the cred for those uh, to our identity model uh, management, as well as uh, integrating that with the existing projects and users. So now you can um, you can have a multi-domain setup, log into an individual domain, create additional domains, um, assign roles to in, in groups or assign users to groups, roles to those groups, etc. So it's a fairly full-featured uh, Keystone v3 API um, implementation in Horizon. Um, we improved uh, Neutron feature support. Um, the key things there were the VPN as a service and uh, firewall as a service support. Um, they're fairly rich, uh, rich panels in um, Horizon now to support those features in Neutron, as well as we moved to a better uh, parity between uh, for uh, security group and, and quota between Neutron and Nova Network. So now you can actually man uh, before Havana you couldn't manage security groups or quotas um, in, uh, in Neutron from Horizon, and now you can. Uh, and the other uh, um, feature that was added is uh, related is um, an interactive network topology. So in the previous release, we had a static network topology, which is which is truly beneficial. To, um, it's much better to be able to visualize uh, your network <laughs> topology um, from a visualization rather than from trying to sort these uh, sort it out from tables. Um, but in the Vano release, we added the ability to not only look at it, but interact with it here. So you can go ahead and launch instances, create a new network, create a router, add it, and see it getting added here, and see how that relationship uh, looks. So other highlights from the Vano release. Um, big one as far as I'm concerned is multi read support. So before Havana, we only uh, Horizon could only see one region, <laughs> and so uh, for for uh, larger installations, multi-region support is is absolutely necessary. So now we can manage services across uh, diverse regions. This helps Horizon become more than a token UI. It's, it's, it's intended to be a true a true UI to manage OpenStack, um, and then trying to keep up with the Nova feature support. Uh, so we we added a bunch of features there, added all default quotas, um, ability to set passwords, availability zone support. Um, so when you're launching instance, you can specify where the availability zones are going to go, or which availability zone that's going to be in, and as well as um, see what availability zone uh, your particular instance is running in. Um, resizing instances, uh, boot from volumes, improved boot from volume support, and uh, per project flavor support. Um, and the last item we added it was uh, tr Trove integration. So although Trove was still in incubation and uh, at the end of the Havana release, um, they had the UI far enough along that we felt um, felt comfortable including it in the Havana release. Um, we label it as experimental because it is not part. It is not. Um, it was not a part of the official uh, release for Havana. Um, so there was the ability to turn it on and turn it off, but um, you could, with the integration that was that was provided in Nevada, you could um, you could create your uh, managed database and as well as uh, the backups of those of databases. Please. So what are our priorities for Ice House? Um, we have a we have quite a list of uh, items we'd like to get done. Uh, these are just the, the top uh, ones. Uh, the first is role-based access control. So in Havana, we added the we added the start to this. We added the a policy engine into Horizon um, to allow and uh, implement it for the the Keystone elements inside of Horizon, but. Basically, the idea, the idea here, as with all the other policy engines in OpenStack, is to be able to have finer grain access control, right? We, we want to be able to uh, provide or enable certain actions based on what roles you have. Um, so the idea now is, now that we have the engine, now that we have the Keystone support, we'd like to 
we'd like to enhance that nice house. We'd like to make it. Uh, we'd like to extend it throughout Horizon. And um, one of the benefits of that would be not only um, finer grain access control, but hopefully condensing the project dashboard and the admin dashboard, and just use rule-based access control to uh, define what the user sees. Um, I think this would greatly simplify the code base, reduce some duplication, reduce some overhead, that sort of thing. Um, so it, this is a this is a big uh, big item we'd like to kick out. Um, another thing we're looking to do is uh, create a more extensible user interface layout. Uh, so uh, currently we have the two tab dashboards side by side. Um, it doesn't really give us a whole lot of room for expansion. Um, one of the fundamental guiding principles for the Horizon project is we want to support extensibility. Um, you can't expect that what the upstream Horizon project delivers is going to be the final user face, or fi final user interface um, for anybody pulling it down. They're going to want to add features to it. They're going to want to add new dashboards to it. We don't really have the space for that right now, um, unless you have maybe a three-lettered name dashboard <laughs> and one of them. So uh, we're going to change the layout. It's going to be more of an accordion-style layout. Um, still going to be on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, and we're going to move around the project selection in some context, context information. Um, it should be a more versatile user interface and certainly more extensible. Um, once we knock those first two items out, um, we're going to start inputting some information architecture changes. So basically what that is is we, we're going to organize the data differently. Um, the identity will be pulled out into its own dashboard. What, what is currently identity um, will be pulled out in its own dashboard. Um, and again, the, once we have the role-based access control, a lot of what's in project and admin will get condensed. And uh, we'll, we'll, um, there's more information on that. On, um, on the UX, uh, the OpenStack UX site. Um, but basically, we want, we want to make it more sensible. Um, we want to include better speedometer integration. So right now we have limited speedometer support in the admin panel, and it's it by itself. Um, it's, it's, it's its own panel inside the, uh, the admin dashboard. What we'd like to do is not only have that type of feature, but also be able to sprink, sprinkle um, graphs of spark lines throughout, uh, throughout the other panels. So use the information from Solometer to better inform the user. Um, better, uh, richer client interactions. So we've, we've adopted AngularJS as a, as a JavaScript platform inside Horizon. We're going to, um, the first steps are just trying to make some of the workflows a little more user friendly. Um, and better validation between client and server side. Um, one that's already been knocked out is uh, configurable dashboard loading. Um, so the idea here is right now you have to do a bunch of config file changes to load dashboards or, or, so, or to, um, to change what dashboards load, what order they load in. What we'd like to be able to do is just drop, um, say, a, a Company A pulls down Horizon. They want to add a dashboard. They should be able to, or, or remove a dashboard. They should be able to do that easily. So they can either drop the dashboard in 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 place, set a config file, and have it read in or or not. Um, another thing we'd like to do is split Horizon from the OpenStack dashboard. Uh, this so there's a little disparity here, but Horizon is, is essentially the toolkit library that that opens Stack dashboard uses, um, and so we'd like to, as it's a library, and as other groups like to build off this library, we'd like to simplify things by splitting out the Horizon section of it, the actual toolkit side of it, and, and leave what's in OpenStack dashboard as the actual application that uh, that manages this OpenStack. Um, and we think this will simplify. They'll simplify build and packaging, but it will also simplify. Um, like for people who are trying to, for projects in incubation where they don't want to maybe pull down the whole entire OpenStack dashboard, um, and they just want to extend Horizon to, to implement a user interface um, for new features. Um, and last, we or on here, we'd like to do have better Tempest integration. So currently, Horizon, I, I believe, has about one 
test in Tempest, and it's basically just a sanity check. Um, as Horizon utilizes most most parts of the stack, um, we feel like it's a it would be a great place to at least test the Python the, the Python let's say Python Keystone Python Cinder client the, the, all the clients uh, to validate that there's no um, not that no changes break backwards compatibility. And since we exercise all those fairly uh, extensively, um, this is not only for preservation of Horizon uh, working, but also uh, we just feel like it's a good integration point uh, to make sure those changes don't happen that, that are detrimental to the stack. And that is all I have. Is there any questions? I see one over in the chat, I believe. So Keystone LDAP. LDAP. Yeah, so does Keystone support LDAP integration? Yes, it, it does in a state now. They're currently working on um, better support for LDAP um, with federated backends. Uh, so what if it were ready, we would like to have it included in the Ice House release for um, in the Ice House release for Horizon. Um, most likely, this is probably going to slip to for at least for as Horizon goes till the early uh, Juno time frame, um, just so that that can stabilize. Other questions for David? Anyone? Can't have dead air for too long, but feel free to ask your chat if there are any questions or you can the line is open as well. Going, going. Okay, well that looks like that's it. Um well, that's good. Which we'll end a little bit early today. Thank you for joining everyone. Uh, please check back for postings of this webinar and our speakers' presentations on OpenStack on the Foundation's uh, YouTube channel as well as our blog. I'll hopefully post those Friday or Monday. And thanks again to our speakers. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, David. And thank if you. there are no more questions, yes, appreciate your time. This concludes our webinar then. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you.